Hey all, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. In this episode, I have another great interview. Uh, I talked to Bubble, who is an organizer and activist involved in various groups. Um, I don't have too much of an intro beyond that. I uh, was going to talk about some news items, but uh, I've been getting over a sinus infection, so it's thrown off my whole game. And also, I've had troubles with the video editing software for like two weeks. So everything's going very slowly and I'm way behind on processing everything. Uh, one thing I should mention is that we're taking a short break from Red Reviews while Justin has uh, some surgery. He, uh, we, I have one left in the recording can. Uh, so that one will come out relatively quickly. And then the next one we would do is uh, that'll be the last one before the new year. I still have many backlogged inter well three or four backlogged interviews. I have um, uh, multiple ask an anarchist segments and I still have the anarchist reading corner stuff all to put together and then put out. And I would like to start putting out uh, the anarchist reading corner stuff a lot more frequently, but we'll see how that goes. I'm also hoping to find time for some very short episodes where I do a quick hot takes on news, uh, kind of like the ones I've been doing in the intros, but uh, I still haven't figured out how or when I'm going to be able to accomplish that. So stay tuned, and if you're on the YouTube, hit that little notification button or bell so that you can keep up with all the latest developments on the channel. Thanks. <laughs> Hi and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Bubble uh, from Friend Hampton's Leftist Podcast, or Fred yeah. Hampton Leftist. <laughs> yeah, I've been contributing there for a few weeks now. Right on. So I guess uh, a good place to start is just to get you to introduce yourself a little bit. Okay. Okay. Um... My name is Bubble He They. I'm an organizer in Dallas, Texas. Um, I've been organizing for about two years now. Um, uh, I'm an anarchist organizer, and uh, I'm in a ton of different groups: Food Not Bombs, SRA, a couple of groups right I co-founded, uh, DFW, Rainbow Coalition. Um, so yeah, you know, I've just uh, just been kind of throwing myself into the work recently. That's awesome. I, uh, I live in an area where it's incredibly difficult to find other anarchists or like other groups that are doing organizing. So I'm constantly on the look around to find mm. people like, you know, we can, maybe we can do stuff like <laughs> food drives or stuff like that. But it's, yeah. uh, be, it's good to get out in the, into this, the community and actually help people. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, uh, it's certainly helped my, my mindset actually like doing work toward uh, a resilient future that I want to see. You know, a lot of people I think are overwhelmed by all the bad news, you know, climate news, um, For political sure. news. Um, so yeah, it feels good to try to do something about it. That's awesome. Um, so I guess, you said you're an anarchist. Is there a, a particular strain of anarchism you lean towards or is there a, just uh, a general anarchist? Yeah, I just, I just use anarchist. I try to draw on a lot of different schools. Um, you know, I think there's important insights that schools miss. Yeah. There's, you know, Western anarchism, there's indigenous traditions of anarchism. And uh, I, I try to draw on a little of everything. That's awesome. Yeah. I've, uh, I've had some conversations with uh, indigenous folks who uh, they don't even, they don't use the term anarchism, but they kind of eschew the entire concept of left versus right politics. Like they don't uh, adhere to that and they consider it kind of like a, a, a settler mindset, I guess, which I find very interesting and, and really actually kind of appealing. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I've had a lot of conversations recently about how, um, labels can, can cause division for no reason. Um, yeah. <laughs> I was arguing with some social Democrats actually earlier today and they were like, 
well, all these things you're describing sound like a government. And I'm like, well, look, if you want to call it a government, that's, <laughs> what is the difference? Like, right. It's yeah. a good thing. It's a good, it's a better way to live. Yeah. It's like uh, talking to a Marxist Leninist and they're talking about a party. Well, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I believe in kind of a union of various sorts, <laughs> you know? So if you want to call it a party, I guess we don't really disagree, right? <laughs> Yeah. And um, like something I've been trying to uh, study recently is uh, historically, there were all of these networks of mutual aid in India that the British dismantled uh, as they colonized the subcontinent. And of course, those people wouldn't have identified as anarchists, but that doesn't mean we can't learn from and, and, uh, you know, use their history to build. For sure. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's great for us uh, when people say, well, what is an example of an anarchist society that's worked? And you can go, hey, this looks like anarchism over here. And this looks like anarchism over there. Maybe they didn't call it that, but it looks like the same thing as we're talking about. Yeah. So uh, one of the things that I I always have here is, uh, is there anything specific that you would like to promote? And uh, I guess you have join uh, the DSA and, and various other groups. Um, how many groups are you actually involved with? (laughs) (laughs) It's it's hard to keep track. Um, but I think five to seven, um, my project, uh, that, that I started, uh, doing solo in the beginning is, uh, anarcho airsoft uh, or anarcho airsoftist on, on IG and Twitter. Um, so we've been doing different kinds of training, incorporating airsoft guns and, you know, it's a lot of fun. It's very practical. For sure. That's neat. Yeah. Uh, and this may be too late by the, by the time this comes out, but the uh, Dallas Liberation March or Dallas uh, Reproductive Liberation March is coming up. Um, I think there's going to be national marches. The laws in Texas have just gotten out of control. And that's a fight that, um, you know, I, I care very deeply about fighting um, for the rest yeah. of this year, at least. Very, yeah. Yeah, I just recently read about uh, there was a doctor who intentionally did an abortion in Texas so that he could be sued by whoever, like based on these new laws or whatever, and it can go to the Supreme court. Yeah. There's, there's lots of court battles, lots of activism. Um, yeah. It's going to be a big fight for sure. I mean, hopefully uh, things, hopefully the law is clear enough uh, that even a six, three, uh, <laughs> Uh, conservative leaning Supreme court has to rule the right way, but I hope so. I mean, there's a lot of rumblings about Roe v. Wade being overturned. Um, yeah. so that's something to keep an eye on. Certainly concerning for, uh, women's, uh, well, individuals, reproductive rights in, uh, Texas and yeah. the whole U S right. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, the architect for the abortion ban bill in Texas, he's now pushing to ban gay marriage and to criminalize gay sex. So this is just the beginning. And I've kind of um, been warning people, I believe there's a wave of legal repression coming. I think, you know, it kind of died down the past maybe four or five years. um, And they're going to start coming for leftists and marginalized groups um, harder than before. Well, and, and you even see it a little bit with like, uh, uh, the declaration of, uh, who counts as a political terrorist or whatever it was there that Biden had, where he like, he didn't just name, uh, far right groups, right? Like there were leftist groups, black lives matter groups, uh, uh, anarchists on that list. So yeah, and the American uh, Psychiatric Association recently classified anarchists as a uh, uh, terrorists. I don't know why they classify <laughs> anyone as terrorists. They, why do they get to say? <laughs> they they released uh, I think it was a paper about uh, deprogramming uh, radical terrorists and and, and anarchists, uh, are anarchists were one of them and anti capitalists in general. Actually, they said anarchists and anti capitalists. Wow. Yeah. It's so bizarre because we, I often try to not to label things as a mental illness or like, you know, because yeah, then you start, you start down, I guess, a slippery slope and uh, it's just, 
I guess that's the evidence there that once you let people start labeling everything as a mental illness, they'll just say what any ideology they don't like is a mental illness. Yeah, I've never been anti-psych, but that paper really yeah. made me realize um, viscerally the validity of what anti-psych people are talking about, which is like the historical um, pathologization of, of uh, anyone who is opposing the system. Yeah, the anybody who's anti-status quo, right, is yeah. – is, yeah. I, I just had a conversation with some people about uh, – uh, actually, on, on one of my other podcasts, we talked about uh, children being diagnosed with like, uh, what is it, like a, a defiance disorder or some sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. And it, it sounds like they just, I mean, maybe it's a legitimate thing in some cases, but they stick it on kids all the, over the place just who, because they don't fit into their cookie cutter. <laughs> yeah, it's it's very concerning on its face if, if um defying authority is a mental illness right yeah that's although i suppose it shouldn't surprise me that people in authority consider defying authority <laughs> to be a, uh something wrong with you right yeah it kind of harkens back to um things i've read about colonialism to where they were like you know if these people don't want to be enslaved then clearly they, they're mentally ill <laughs> Yeah, that sounds about right. That's, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know really what to say about that so much because it's like it seems so absurd and yet also so much the way that the world is, right? Yeah. So I'm curious about uh your work in DSA. Like uh you say you're an anarchist. How does that work with uh like I say the DSA is or or that's the Democratic Socialists of America, right? Yeah, it is. I'm actually not a member of DSA. Uh, I have a lot of friends who are. Okay. Um, and I, and I, I work joint events with them. Uh, but I will say I saw a pretty funny picture of the anarchist caucus of the DSA. <laughs> and they oh. had a big anarchist flag. Um, and nice. <laughs> uh, they look pretty militant. It's a funny picture. Maybe you, maybe you could Google it. But, yeah, uh, I'll have to do that. <laughs> yeah, my understanding of them is it's, it's a big tent. Uh, that's cool. There's a lot of contradictions there. Yeah, I suppose it's when you're trying on the left, when you're trying to gain power in countries that are typically anti-left, um, we got to do what we can, right? Yeah. You know, personally, I've, I've done things in electoral politics before, but, uh, currently I'm, I don't really see much hope in that sphere. Um, which is one of the yeah. big reasons I don't think I'll ever join DSA because they focus a lot of their efforts there. But I'm glad it exists and it, it brings a lot of people into um, doing cool stuff. Yeah, we have uh, a similar thing. Like we have the Democratic Socialists of Canada here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I, I enjoy their content. I, I like the guys that I know out of that group. And uh, But again, like you say, they focus so much on the election, electoral stuff. And I just don't. I don't see that as being the only key to changing things. Although I don't want to say that it, it's not valuable either. Right. Like I know there's a lot of leftists who really, they, they, they absolutely think that none of us should be involved in electoral politics at all, but I'm not, so I'm not there. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it's just, it's such a, it's such a mess. It's such a money and time pit, you know, it's, yeah when I imagine all of the thousands of volunteers and millions of dollars spent on just losing an election anyway, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Imagine, imagine if they were building a mutual aid organization, right. That would be right. Something yeah. beyond yeah. impressive. Yeah. Like you say, like thousands of volunteers all working towards like some kind of dual power uh, kind of system. That would be pretty helpful. I think. Yeah, absolutely. Which leads, I guess, into uh, like food, not bombs, stuff like that, eh? Yeah, absolutely. I guess I talk about, I've talked about food, not bombs in the past, I, I think on the show, but uh, just in case people aren't familiar with that, uh, what is food, not bombs? Uh, food, not bombs is a national organization uh, started in the U.S. in the 1970s, I believe. Um, 
And basically it's just the principle of free food. Um, they provide free food to unhoused communities, um, climate refugees, uh, protest events, and uh, people get together, they cook um, vegan or vegetarian food and they distribute it. And it's, a, it's an amazing thing. It's been going for a long time. And, uh, you know, it's activated a lot of people. I think uh, Robert Evans mentioned that Food Not Bombs was his first uh, introduction to anarchism. Yeah, it's, it's probably one of the, I guess, longer lasting and more well-known anarchist groups. Yeah, for sure. Um, and there's a lot to it that, that people don't really know about, even if they're aware of the organization. Like Food Not Bombs did a lot in uh, New Orleans after Katrina. And uh, they, they even played a role in, in discouraging the white supremacist militias that were shooting people down there. Right. Um, so it's, yeah, it's a rad group. It's been, a, it's been around for a long, long time. And it has that advantage of there's, there's probably one in your closest city. For most people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so I guess you've also got uh, uh, that you're involved with Arm Your Friends and, and the IWW which I've also uh, met, talked about in the past is that like uh, international workers of the world. Uh, it's a great uh, organization. As soon as I actually have some money, I'm going to be uh, signing up as a, a paid dues member myself. Yeah. IWW is really cool. That's actually another one to where I'm around them a lot. I haven't formally joined. Um, and I, I just recently joined arm your friends. Um, I've been in SRA for a little while. Uh, but you know, there's a lot of cool new groups popping up, like I'm your friends. I think they're about one year old. That's cool. So I guess, uh, with your airsoft stuff, like that's kind mm -hmm. of along that same line of like training with, uh, weapons. Although I guess airsoft guns are maybe less lethal. <laughs> yeah. I don't know anything about guns actually. So. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've been into guns for a while. Airsoft guns are are kind of coming up in the wider gun culture, okay. Um, at least here in America, uh, especially as ammunition gets a lot more expensive. Okay. But there's also a lot of things that you can do with airsoft guns that you can't do with real guns, um, like shooting each other, like uh, <laughs> right, <laughs> doing can... some of the more like high risk. Um, things you know if you need to cross in some in front of someone that's something you never do with a real gun because there's just too high a risk of shooting them in the back right. but with an airsoft gun you can kind of get some of that practical training yeah i suppose and it reduces yeah that's a, a great idea i guess if you're actually training to uh defend uh like a an autonomous zone or something like that yeah or even just for personal self-defense i mean we've had a lot of QAnon murders. We've had a lot of political right. violence here in the U.S. Um, I think it's a it's a growing concern for a lot of leftists. Uh, we also train martial arts, so like hand to hand stuff. Um, I've been a martial artist for twenty years. Okay, cool. So yeah, it's it's fun. It's practical. Uh, that's probably my biggest passion. I try to be involved in everything, but uh, I like teaching that stuff. That's awesome. I. I know like here uh, a lot of people who are kind of lefty or, or, or even like if they're uh, they don't fit into the cis white straight hetero, guy, you know, all that, all the uh, basic, what they consider norms. Right. If you don't fit into that, then you're rejected from a lot of the gun clubs and stuff that are around here. Um, so I don't know if we uh, had a kind of an SRA or, or something like that around us, that would be really good. But uh, I don't think Saskatchewan is maybe even ready for armed socialists yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you never know. Like there's a lot of people I found uh, on Twitter that, uh, you know, they're, they're in your local area. They never, they, they also think there's no one else. And right. uh, yeah, I've seen people be very successful just recruiting off of Twitter. Like, Hey, do you guys want to start something? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, that worked really well for me back in my uh, atheist community days, but I mm -hmm. haven't had so much luck being a <laughs> Saskatchewan leftist on, on Twitter. <laughs> yeah. But uh, 
So you're also involved with the Fred Hampton leftists podcast. Um, yeah. So how long have you been involved with that? Um, I think it's been three weeks now. So similar to, to what I saw you do, they just put out a call. Like we'd like to talk to more leftists, a diverse group of leftists. Um, and I thought, you know, that's a, it's a great opportunity to kind of boost what I'm doing here in Dallas and, you know, talk about ideas with other people. So for sure. Yeah, I jumped on it. It's been, it's been really cool so far. And what is, uh, I guess, what is the kind of the vein of that show? Like, do they have a particular, uh, goal in mind? Um, I'm not sure about a particular goal. You know, the conversations have been very radical. It's been a lot of fun. It's been all about yeah, revolution, direct action, how, you know, how do we do a general strike tomorrow? Things like that. Right. Um, so yeah, it's been really fun. No, that's awesome. <laughs> I spent, uh, I mean, you mentioned Robert Evans, so you probably listened to his newest show. Uh, it could happen here daily. Yeah. Um, after the first couple episodes of that came out and he was talking about general strikes, I like was all over trying to contact people, see what we could do, you know, in Saskatchewan <laughs> for mm-hmm. a general strike. Like it's, it, it requires such planning that we have to start planning it almost now if we want to do it, you know, in a few months, right. <laughs> like, or even yeah. years, like we have to really establish a foundation here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I've looked into the history of general strikes. Usually it's very large unions and, and yeah. uh, coalitions of unions that are able to pull that off. Um, you need a lot of money. You need a lot of food uh, and water and all. Of, yeah. It's, it's an ambitious project. Um, and I'm glad people are excited about it, but it does require a lot of planning. I think. Yeah. Like I work in the oil field in Saskatchewan. Oh, uh, so I, I think that that's almost a bottleneck. If we could, if I could somehow manage to convince uh, a group of me- people who are currently very conservative and very on board with pro oil propaganda, uh, if I could c- somehow convince them that we could, we need to do something to change the way the world is running, uh, then I think that that would be a great place to do it. Because, like I say, like that's a bottleneck. That's where so much of society's money is coming from. But yeah, that would be amazing. The uh, trick, <laughs> the trick is getting these guys on board. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's. I think it's become very difficult to get people out of their partisan bubbles. Yeah. Um, I think the algorithmic information bubbles that we've been placed in, it just, it reinforces everyone's pre-consisting, pre, pre-existing beliefs just constantly. Yeah. I, I even noticed, like, I accidentally started engaging with uh, people who were, I don't know, I would say arguing in bad faith uh, against anarchists. <laughs> and calling you know calling anarchism cringe and stuff like that mm. and and i accidentally started engaging with that and then now all it's all i see <laughs> so so i understand how like a conservative can get stuck in a rut right like or somebody who has those kind of ideas can get stuck in a rut because it just as soon as you change the way you start interacting online it it floods you with all this same content over and over again yeah absolutely and it's uh, I think COVID has made the information divide even worse because there's all of these um, just different facts that people have now about <laughs> ivermectin and COVID right. numbers and yeah, it, how you extract someone from that is is pretty daunting. Yeah, I I got my start in like the show is called The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. I got my start in the skeptical. Uh, community right so we tried to discuss things on an evidence-based way and we tried to argue against conspiracy theorists back before it was everybody (laughs) and and i think for all our efforts in the skeptical community things just got worse so i'm not sure how to do any to give and convince people of anything really yeah it's it's definitely a challenge and i mean ultimately you're working against so much money and power Right. Yeah. There's these news networks and these communications networks. It's it's really funny. I've um I've been on Telegram for a while. Okay. But I've seen uh, right wing telegram just explode. There's hundreds of thousands of people 
in these telegram groups on a daily basis, wow. just consuming, you know, the, the most extreme content you can imagine. <laughs> yeah. I, I was listening, I guess I listened to the Q and on anonymous podcast and they were talking about, I think it was either signal chats or, or uh, telegram. And they're talking about like these places where the QAnon groups are now places where like uh, white supremacist groups are coming into and like kind of infiltrating with, you know, uh, using certain language so that it doesn't seem too overt. And then they, once they convince people, then they start getting more, more overt as time goes on. But yeah, it's, um, it's kind of interesting because extreme right wing thought is actually, you know, kind of more underground at this point than progressive thought. Right. And so uh, those right wing extremists, they have these huge feeding grounds of, you know, one telegram group will be 300,000 boomers, basically. Right. And they can go in there and start kind of nudging them um, about joining extremist beliefs, joining extremist groups. Whereas liberal progressives kind of exist in a, in a mainstream where they're not, you know, you, you can't as easily nudge them like that. They're, you know, they're on Twitter or on Instagram. Yeah. And the thing about uh, like trying to communicate with liberals too, is like to, to pull them to our, our more, maybe more extreme side is they often like look down at us and say like, Oh, well, anarchism is fine in, in theory, but there's no way it would work practically or they, you know, <laughs> or they, yeah. they associate like, uh, Marx with, uh, Stalin, you know, stuff like that. So, yeah. yeah, that was a, a big part of the, the argument with some, uh, uh, democratic socialists I had earlier today, um, is, they were saying, you know, well, that's that's unrealistic. That only works in theory. And so I asked them, you know, what is your timeline for turning us into a Scandinavian welfare state? How do you think that's going to happen? <laughs> and they said, well, you know, we're gonna we're gonna push it left um, over the next forty years. I think we'll get there in forty years. And I said, well, <laughs> how is that realistic? You know, <laughs> you have any idea how bad climate collapse is going to be in forty years? Yeah. I think uh, I think what I'm doing in trying to build, you know, anarchist-ish networks of mutual aid is is much more realistic over the next ten to twenty years. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of, and you know, I think it will change. Uh, I think it is changing. What is considered pragmatic? What's considered realistic? We're kind of waking up from that, uh, like 1990s. Everything will be the same for forever. The end of history. Right. Yeah. Francis Fukuyama. I think that's, that's dying as uh, climate change get wor gets worse. Yeah. It's a shame that it takes uh, that major of a catastrophe to do it, but I guess yeah. at least it's potentially happening. You have under propaganda, counter propaganda, defund the police is fake. So I, I really think that that's probably going to be controversial amongst a lot of people. <laughs> so uh, first, what do you mean by defund the police is fake? I don't mean that there was no one ever advocating for it. Um, what I mean is that it's never happened anywhere. It's not. It's not yeah. really. Uh, it's not a. It's not a policy that ever had a, a risk of becoming um, enacted. <laughs> Um, there's so much propaganda that's like San Francisco defunded the police, Dallas right. defunded the police, New York defunded the police. It's not remotely true. And in fact, I'm pretty sure all those police budgets grew. They yeah. grew less than before, maybe, but <laughs> it didn't even decrease, you know, much less become defunded. Yeah, that doesn't count as defunding when you're still getting an increase in budget. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah, I've there's a lot of stuff uh, people have been talking about, like where the the narrative is that crime is on the rise, mm -hmm. but also that uh, that uh, police have been defunded in various places. So then people can say, well, you you aren't spending as much on police. Therefore, this is what's causing the rise in crime. But 
that's it's not it's not the right way to look at it like it's an error in thinking to put those two together and yeah like you say like there's not actually even any defunding happening so yeah and i think that touches on uh, a broader propaganda effort which is um this idea that the the right is losing um policy wise now socially maybe you could make that argument but in terms of the laws the laws have gotten dramatically more right wing in the past few years yeah it it's uh I, we keep, I keep mentioning podcasts that I listen to, but I listen to five, four pod, uh, which is, they discuss, uh, Supreme court cases and every single case, like they bring up so many cases and it's always, uh, a deterioration of civil rights. It's always a deterioration of, uh, progress. Uh, you know, like it's very rare that the Supreme court has ruled in any kind of way that is advancing, uh, you know, the benefit of people. Yeah. And uh, I think people really have to snap out of the like progress of history narrative because there are cycles. Um, if you look at after the Civil War, you had a bunch of elected black Republican um, representatives and, and government um, officials. And then all of that got rolled back. That all went away. Um, and it can happen again. You, you got to be vigilant for that. Well, yeah, that's, that's exactly it. Like it's, uh, once you can't make progress and then just relax. <laughs> like, yeah. If only we could, <laughs> that doesn't seem to be the way that things are working. Yeah. You can never go back to brunch. <laughs> no, that's right. No more brunch ever. All right. Uh, on to foes and comrades. So we've got, uh, the foe is Texas laws, which I guess we kind of mentioned earlier, but um, is there anything you want to go further in depth on that about? Um, I, it's so many. It's 666 uh, that went into effect this year. Holy shit. I, I don't even know what half of them are about, um, but obviously there's the really big ones. Um, abortion is banned after six weeks in Texas. That is a huge blow against um, reproductive rights. Um, it's illegal to transport undocumented migrants, um, which, you know, I believe is, is a step towards, you know, an ethnic cleansing essentially, which we've seen in Texas before to where they just tried to expel, um, you know, all people of, of Latino descent, the, the laws in Texas and also Florida, which I don't, follow as closely because I don't live there um, are just becoming extremely fascistic. And I, you know, I, I think people who don't live here may not realize the extent of it. It's, it's outrageous. Yeah. And that's no good. Um, uh, I guess out of curiosity, what are some ways that uh, you think maybe people can fight against these laws or, or is there anything that we, that people can do? Um, there's all kinds of, different groups working on it. There's people taking the court case uh, angle. There's uh, protest groups. Um, there's electoral groups also. Uh, I would definitely encourage people to focus more on the protest groups and the mutual aid groups. Um, but, you know, there's, there's so many different angles and the, the really cynical side of me um, uh, ha has this, this uh, buzzing in my head, like on some level, the, the Democrats have to love this because there's so much fundraising and uh, right. active, you know, um, active volunteerism. Yeah. I mean, it sounds cynical, right? But it's probably not far off from true either. <laughs> like, no, I'm sure some, someone somewhere has had that discussion. Like this is going to be great for us. We're going to raise a ton of money. Right. Yeah. It's, it's, I guess it's the same, like the, the hashtag resistance or whatever online, right? It doesn't actually solve anything, but it funnels money to political candidates from the Democratic Party. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and people have said similar things for decades that, that the Democrats love to lose because it really does help them in a lot of ways. You know, yeah. as, a, as a party, as an organization, 
they don't necessarily benefit by passing laws that their voters want. They, they benefit when people give them money and get excited. Yeah. But <laughs> that's, that's so, yeah, it is. It's so not cool. Like I, I really, I, yeah. I don't know how else to say it. Like that's really shitty. Right. But it, it's system. just the way it okay. is. Yeah. No, it is a terrible system. Okay. And for your comrades, you have mutual aid groups have been scaling up. So I guess that's like your food, not bombs and your, uh, local groups that have been, uh, kind of helping people out. Yeah. And there are not as political groups. Um, in my area, there's a harvest project and Oak cliff veggie project. Um, they do growing and distributing food, uh, during the winter storm in Texas that shut down our power and a lot of our clean water, um, mutual aid groups took the lead in distributing millions of bottles of water. We had, um, you know, like 12 and 14 foot trucks, heavy trucks that, that we were moving stuff around in. I'd never seen something on that scale before. So, you know, that was encouraging kind of uh, things are falling apart, but there are also groups rising to meet the challenge. Yeah. It's where States fail. Citizens have to step in, right? Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, is there anything else uh, that you think uh, you should want to mention that I haven't asked about or that uh, we haven't discussed? Um, yeah, I don't know. Go, go check out uh, the, the training we're doing at Anarcho Airsoftist. Um, I, I've been trying to make instructional videos as well as, as um, other stuff because there's a limit to the space and the, the resources we have, but I would love to see more leftists um, training self-defense just because those are useful skills. Uh, you know, I used to, I used to follow the actions that they had. Well, I mean, I still do, but following the actions in like Portland and San Francisco, oh, yeah. I'm sick of, I'm sick of seeing uh, kids get beat up, you know? Yep. I was just watching a video on uh, the proud boys here this morning and it's just, it's so frustrating to watch them get away with stuff like that. Like yeah. just going around and beating up people like, yeah, it's not, it's very no, frustrating. It's, it's awful. And I think a lot of people have realized that law enforcement itself is very right wing and also kind of beyond the control of, of local governments. Yeah. Um, there's things you can't, force the police to do if they don't want to arrest proud boys the mayor can't make them arrest proud boys essentially no that's um, right yeah so with that in mind uh you know i want to encourage people to um become better fighters <laughs> i guess yeah 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 the, yeah i don't i don't have a really other solution for that like uh in canada we have uh slight we have fewer guns than mm -hmm. in the u.s obviously so there's a, a much lower risk of uh getting shot if you are counter protesting or uh, encountering the a group like the proud boys on the street uh but in the u.s there's an there's a, a chance you could get shot and that that's scary uh but also somebody has to stand up to them or else it's like the bully who just gets to run the playground forever right like <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean there's there's really no other options. Even if no one ever counter protested, um, they still hunt people down. You yeah. know, if you're, yeah. if you come under their attention, you know, they will come to your house. So you should prepare. Yeah, for sure. Okay. So I guess we kind of touched on things already, but uh, where can people find uh, content from you? Um, you can find me at Anarcho Airsoftist, at Fight for Black Lives, at Bubble Break. Um, yeah, those are the main ones. Cool. Oh, I'm sorry. You can also see me on Fred Hampton Leftists every Wednesday at uh, 5.30 Eastern Time. And that's is that on YouTube? Uh, it's on YouTube. They have, they have streams live on Twitter. Uh, okay. I think Periscope. Oh. Um, yeah. Very cool. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. And we'll, uh, I'll try and keep in touch so we can maybe uh, collaborate some more. Sure. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. 
That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated, and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a re- and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show, From Many People's Strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics, and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at Hope that's called Atheist Humanist Leftist Revolutionaries. My Twitter is at Skeptical Lefty, and my Facebook page is The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. You can email me at mindofaskepticalleftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>